What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, so picking up with uh, really the conclusion of God, Love, uh, God Loves Man Kills, which by the way, I've got a cold, you guys can probably tell. <laughs> I'm actually getting over it, but uh, still, it sucks. But anyway, picking up with God Loves Man Kills, the, the conclusion of all this, we switch over to Charles Xavier. Now, this is where you really start to see how screwed up William Stryker is. When this happens, we basically switch over to Manhattan, to the to the headquarters of the Stryker Crusade, and one of the things that they say, you know, that really kind of gets thrown in here is, and then they, br they bring him under the place Golgotha, and they crucify him. That is a testament to Jesus. Jesus was crucified there. Now, the the idea behind this is that when this happens with Xavier, uh, with him being crucified, it's all the X-Men who show up and literally start like stabbing him, you know, jabbing at him, ripping his heart out. It's all the, these forms of psychic torture. Now, in reality, this is not truly happening, but this is the worst conceivable nightmare for Charles Xavier. And that's one of the things to bear in mind is that for Charles Xavier, there's really kind of like two aspects of, of what it is that he does. You've got the X-Men, so basically creating like a peaceful coexistence between humans and mutants. And then you've got the X-Men as his actual children is really how he sees them. And the way that William striker plays this out is that in the midst of all this torture in this this place of darkness and pain that he kind of shows up as a savior of sorts it says look surrender yourself to me and everything will be okay give yourself to me and in turn i will lead you to paradise very much presenting himself as god or as a god as a christ-like figure because it really fits well within the religious themes of william striker and the role that he plays the issue with this is that charles xavier resists to a degree now it's one of these things where this has been going on for 15 hours and so there's no sight there, there's really no end in sight and that's the nature of William Stryker. When he goes in and he starts talking to Philip Ramsey, who's like a psychologist, who's the one implementing all this psychological torture, the results here are that Xavier is slowly being broken down. Now, the other the other part of this, of course, is that you have Cyclops and you have Storm, and the question that's asked of them is, why are you doing this? Like, what's the basis behind all this in the first place? Do you really just hate mutants that much? And the response of William Stryker is, is kind of amazing here. And this is where you start to see, you know, Fox having drawn their elements from his character, but not really taking the next step for fear of pissing off all the Christians. But the idea here is, is that originally William Stryker was a member of the U.S. military, and when he had finally finished his, you know, his leave, or I guess his, his tour, basically, or at least when he was on break from his tour, he and his wife were traveling when, of course, she was pregnant, and then began to give birth to their child. You know, in the midst of this car wreck that they experienced, when the when the birthing process began and the child was actually born, William Stryker realized it was a mutant, and believing that it was, had killed the child. Now, when his wife asked for the baby, he in turn broke her neck. This is a man that killed his own wife and child. It's extreme. Now, where this originally stemmed from fear, he in turn got into the vehicle and then lit a match intending to kill both of, you know all of them in the process and he was blown free from the from the entire explosion and in his mind he rationalized god saved me from this fate god wants me to go forward and destroy all these mutants now the other part of this is this goes into a guy by the name of fred duncan now fred duncan was a character who was created by stanley and jack kirby uh, and he originally appeared when like the vanisher first showed up when it comes to marvel this is one of the things to bear in mind when it comes to marvel comics you oftentimes see liaisons right like when x factor first not really when they first showed up when the the original x-men left x factor and a new team was brought in in the early 1990s, you got Valerie Cooper, and then you got Forge. You basically had these characters who were like liaisons between the X Factor and the and the federal government. With Fred Duncan, he was a liaison between the FBI and the X-Men themselves. And so it was kind of like a give and take here. He'd be one of those guys who would basically warn the X-Men if something was coming down the pipe that could threaten them or they were they were going to be needed. But he was also a character who the X-Men would relay information to on their various goings on and things that were happening. Now, where this was kind of like a tenuous relationship and where Fred Duncan was more of a friend of, of Xavier and the rest of the X-Men didn't truly trust him when events began to unfold like the like the the formation of project wide awake when you started getting into the the federal government basically using the fbi the nsa the cia all these various organizations for the purpose of like spying on the mutant threat trying to contain and control it fred duncan would pass information to the x-men and basically become more of a friend kind of giving them a step ahead of what the federal government was doing but the fact remains here this is one of the things that william striker was doing was that he had a member of the striker crusade working in the fbi and that member was taking information that was being gained by fred duncan and pulling it in and giving it to William Stryker. The purifiers are all over the place. Anybody could be one of these guys. It's like a modern day clan, except they don't wear white hoods and white outfits and all that kind of crazy stuff. So again, it's pretty extreme and it's pretty dark. Now, what we also have to remember here is, is that Kitty Pride had basically stowed away alongside with the purifiers when they showed up at the Xavier Institute while the rest of the X-Men were away and kidnapped Ileana Rasputin, the sister of Colossus. And so when this happened, of course, Kitty Pride's uh, location was like the purifiers were aware that she was there. They essentially used nerve gas to knock her out. But when they actually get to the location when the question is asked you know to william striker we have Ileana rasputin what do you want us to do with kitty pride he simply says kill her the guy's willing to kill a 15 year old girl it's ex it's, ex it's extreme now of course kitty pride makes her escape but the problem with this is that she's still suffering from
from the effects of nerve gas, which hasn't totally worn off yet. And so her phasing powers aren't at 100%. She's literally just kind of fleeing for her life. And so in this instance, when Kitty Pride basically makes her way into the Bronx, she ends up running across a gang. And of course, we know what the gang's intentions are with her, despite the fact that she's 15 years old. And so when they try to make a move and they basically try to force themselves on her, of course, you have Anne from the Purifiers who shows up, who in turn looks to kill Kitty Pride. Now, this is the nature of the Purifiers. They'll kill whoever gets in their way. It doesn't matter who you are. If you are in the way of them and a mutant, they will kill you to get to that mutant. It's how extreme they are. And so, of course, Anne in turn kills all the gang members. Kitty Pride manages to make her escape. And then, of course, calls Nightcrawler back at the Xavier Institute and says, hey, here's where I am. And then, of course, there's a massive explosion. The Purifiers are still chasing her down. That's the intensity that goes on here. Yes, the Purifiers are human. Yes, they tire. But Kitty Pride's in a weakened state. They will constantly chase her until they finally get a hold of her. It's the nature of who they are. And so, in this moment, you know, when she finally manages to stow away aboard a subway train and manages to make her escape, the Purifiers track her down. They chase her down. They try to take her out. And of course, that leads to the arrival of Colossus, Wolverine, Nightcrawler, the whole nine yards. And they basically take out these Purifiers. And of course, is a survivor. She manages to make her escape. But it's still pretty extreme because then you switch back over to Charles Xavier. And this is where the, the continued mental torture of Charles. Xavier has begun to finally take its toll. That the, the psychic torture he's been experiencing has slowly been eroding away at his mental blocks to the point that when William Stryker finally steps in and says, are you ready to embrace the word of God? Are you ready to become a believer in the power of Christ? That, that in turn, Xavier's response is, Yes. And then William Stryker says, then kill Cyclops and Storm. And where he initially resists, what William Stryker does here is he says, only those who are worthy will be accepted. Only those who are worthy will be viewed by me as being worthy. So if you truly want to, to attain the splendor of heaven, if you truly want to attain something greater, then you have to kill them. And Charles Xavier says, okay. And he kills Cyclops and Storm. And it is mind blowing. When this happened, like I, I remember reading this, X-Men the Animated Series, my dad introduces me to comic books and I in turn start reading everything I possibly can. When I'm reading this, oh, it blew me away. And it's like, okay, Xavier's ready. Because what they're going to do is they're going to go to this garden, this massive event that they're putting on, like a giant church sermon. And when, what's going to go on behind the scenes is Xavier's mind is going to pick up everyone who's a mutant. And all those mutants who are there are going to be killed by Xavier. And so where you end up having like Philip Ramsey, who basically gets in his vehicle and leaves to go back and change, get a shower, so on and so forth, and then head to the garden proper, he's intercepted by Kurt Wagner. Now, this is where Nightcrawler begins to show his darker half, where he really is more of like a loving and a gentle character. When it comes down to it, Nightcrawler can and scare the hell out of you because of how he looks. I mean, if you've got someone that shows up to you looking like a devil and then starts teleporting you around the world, it's going to scare you out of your wits. And that's literally what he does with Philip. He snatches him up and says, like, I'm here to inflict pain and torture. I'm here to take all the nightmares you've ever had of what, of what mutants are, and I'm here to bring them to your doorstep. We have a lot of ways that we can make you hurt. We have even more ways that we can kill you. So which one is it going to be? Do you want to hurt or do you want to die? And so ultimately, Philip Ramsey hands the information over. And so where you end up having, you know, the bodies of Storm and Cyclops who were unceremonial thrown onto these these beds and then carted down to the incinerators you end up having like the elevator which just like jerks up to the top because they have Ileana Rasputin going with them you know and so like it literally jerks to the top and just plunges out of the building only for us to find out Magneto was the one who's doing it and so Anne the purifier jumps out of the elevator grabs onto the edge of the building flees for her life and then you have like Wolverine who sits down and says they're not dead now to be honest this is a bit of a MacGuffin but that's the nature of Chris Claremont storytelling right like Chris Claremont doesn't tell this for shock value with Chris Claremont when he wrote these stories the way that he when he did things like this, it was designed for the purpose to show how bad things were. It's designed to show you how broken Charles Xavier is. Well, then the question becomes, if they're not dead, why are they not dead? And the answer to this question is because Charles Xavier is still fighting back. There's still some part of him that's fighting back as best he can. And so what he had essentially done was shut down the minds of Storm and Cyclops. As far as anybody out there using machines to read them was aware, they were dead because their mental patterns were operating at such a low rate that they would seem to be dead. It's a cool little thing to see because it shows the bond between Xavier Xavier and the X-Men, that it's this unbreakable thing, that Xavier, while he do has done some shady things, while he has done some things that maybe seem like betrayal, the one thing he would not do is kill his own X-Men. Stories like these are why events like Avengers vs. X-Men, when Cyclops kills Xavier, is so significant. But with Xavier being in the mental state that William Stryker expects him to be in, that's one of the important things to bear in mind. Xavier is fighting in such a way to where subconsciously he'll preserve the X-Men, but you're talking about the rest of the mutant population, and Xavier does not care for the rest of the mutant population the way he does care for the X-Men. And so this is still a tangible possibility that Xavier will be brought to the garden, that he'll he'll be put on display for the world to see that William Stryker 
will use him to kill all the mutants in this immediate vicinity, turn him into a weapon. And then in turn, like it's, it's really just kind of a test bed. Will this work in this immediate area? And if it will, well then in turn, like I can espouse this and say, see guys, God hates mutants. Look at this. Cause no one's going to know that Xavier is the one that's doing it. It's just gonna be like, Hey guys, God hates mutants. Like look at, look at God smiting the mutant population. So again, it's extreme, but remember that's the nature of William Stryker. While all that's happening, the power of Xavier is being put to work and all these various mutants are being made to suffer. Their minds are being scrambled. They're, they're really on the verge of being killed. You have Magneto who fights back as best he can, but there's only so much that he can do. One of the things to bear in mind here though, is the nature of the people who are attending. When it comes to something like this, when it comes to extreme views, extreme views draw extremists and extreme views make extremists out of non-extreme people. And so it's literally fear mongering. It's telling people exactly what they want to hear. That's exactly what William Stryker does here. And it works stupendously because in a state of desperation, people will believe what they want to believe. And so you've already got people who already have this sort of base, you know, baseline hatred for the mutant population. William Stryker comes along and says, behold, the power of Christ amplifies that mutant hatred. And then in turn uses that fear to amplify their fear and hate even more. It's one of the best political maneuvers a person can make. So that's one of the reasons why Chris Claremont's storytelling was incredibly political. It was always political. It was never not political, but it was always cool the way that it was done. And so where you have the X-Men basically trying to fight off as best they can, the only people who are being affected here are mutants. And so what this means is that with Charles Xavier's mind working, it's kind of like a beacon. It's kind of a radar. It kind of reveals the, the hidden mutant population among them, one of whom is Anne, who's actually one of the members of the Purifiers. What a mutant power is, we don't know. We're never told. But William Stryker doesn't care. And so where Anne has been faithful, his best soldier to this point, he pushes her off the platform, she falls and breaks her neck, and that's the end of Anne. This unceremonious end to an otherwise devoted follower who turned out to be a mutant. That's just the way this game gets played. And so as a result, the devices that are being used to kind of amplify the power of Xavier are taken out by Cyclops. And in doing so, that leads to the rest of the X-Men kind of asking the question, well, what do we do now? And the initial response is, well, we can kill William Stryker. But the response of Cyclops is, no, we're not going to kill him. What we're going to do is we're going to discredit him. And that's the best move that he can make. And the reason why is because you're talking about this massive gathering that's being televised all across the world. If the X-Men walked in there and killed him, it would make him a martyr. And so Cyclops walks in and says, we have to debate him. We have to destroy his credibility on TV and reduce his argument down to nothing. That's the best way to win because winning the hearts and minds of people is not done through physical violence. And so when you have Cyclops who goes in and says, hey, look, we're going to have a debate. We're going to argue with you. His response is like, yes, we're mutants, but like we're also human beings too. We have abilities, but are our abilities so different from like a world-class astronomer or a master chess player? Are they really that different? These gifts sure manifest in a physical way and some of them are dangerous, but just just like any other circumstance, a villain, like a, a criminal with a handgun, a gangbanger, a doctor that practices euthanasia, whatever the case is, we have an ability, we have a gift, and we can use it for good or evil. There are those of us who use it for evil and those of us who use it for good. But does that mean that every gun owner is a bad guy? Does it mean that every gun owner is a criminal? Of course it doesn't. It means that there are those who own guns and there are those who are going to commit bad acts with them. But just because a person can do a bad thing doesn't mean they will do a bad thing. We are not an inherently evil group of people, but that's the nature of extremist views. Extremist views do not see gray areas. It's a very, very dangerous ideology to have. And because he's cornered in this argument, because of the fact that he's that, that he's told by, by Cyclops, look, for all you know, it could be that we're baseline humans and that you're the mutation, that everybody, that the people are supposed to be born with powers. You know, because I mean, Cyclops is really kind of talking out of his ass at that point, but it's like people are born with powers. You are born without powers. So what if you're the mutation here? And even if that's not the case, we are the next step in human evolution. Men were apes once. And that literally is an affront to everything William Stryker believes. Divine creation. God created heaven, the earth, firmament, you know, all that kind of good stuff. And in his desperation, he does the only thing he knows how to do. He turns to violence and he literally pulls a gun and points it at Kitty Pryde with the intention of shooting her and the X-Men stand down. They stand there and do nothing because what this does is it shows that the argument of William Stryker has no merit. There's no real ground to it. It's simply him just espousing nonsense under the belief that like people will believe him. And when there's nothing left, when, when the foundation of his argument is literally destroyed, he turns to violence. Violence is an act of desperation and it's an act of desperation by desperate men and women. When they have nothing else, they'll turn to violence. The X-Men stand down and then he's shot by a cop. And one of the cops is just like, he was going to shoot a 15 year old unarmed child. Not a chance I was going to let that happen. This cop does his duty. He shoots William Stryker and says, the X-Men have done nothing wrong here. The X-Men are, are victims of an otherwise deranged man who believes that God wants him to kill mutants. This guy was going to kill innocent people. I shot this guy. He's going to go to jail. The X-Men, you're free to go. You're victims of a kidnapping and torture. Just, just get out of here. And so following that, what this does is this leads to this really, really interesting uh, scenario. We 
you kind of go into this epilogue and you basically have like the aftermath of all this and William Stryker's taken to jail and so on and so forth. And the X-Men are talking to Charles Xavier and Charles Xavier starts to adopt the mindset of Magneto. And this comes out of Charles Xavier's, uh, Charles Xavier experience. The guy was tortured consistently for almost a full 24 hours. He was psychologically tortured and it almost destroyed his perception of humanity. What happens when you encounter a man who is so fanatical, who is so far gone that his belief system is derived from faith, derived from God, this incorruptible, unshakable thing. And he says, because of my faith, because of this unshakable belief, I am going to wipe out the entirety of the mutant population. What do you do in the face of that? Like, how do you function in the face of that? What William Stryker showed Charles Xavier is that there are men out there whose hearts and minds cannot be changed. They cannot be reasoned with. They can't be bargained with. There's nothing you can do to convince them that their way is the wrong way, that the only way to really stop them is to kill them. And what that's done is it's destroyed Charles Xavier's perception that a peaceful coexistence can be achieved, that he sits in this chair and says, maybe Magneto's right. Maybe there really is no way to save the hearts and minds of men because William Stryker was a religious fundamentalist. But what happens when you have men and women in positions of power that cannot be touched, they cannot be stopped, and, can, and sometimes can't even be seen because their presences are so secretive? What happens when they're the ones whose hearts and minds can't be changed? What happens when a person decides they want to press the nuclear option? What happens? When you run into that situation, how do you cope with that? How do you deal with that? And Xavier's response is, you can't. William Stryker showed me that there are people out there who just can't be, they can't be convinced. And if they can't be convinced, then maybe this is a, this is a fruitless effort. Maybe it's pointless. But the, the argument Cyclops makes here is, no, it's not. William Stryker was one man. What do you have to say about the cop who shot him? What do you have to say about those who began to look at what William Stryker was saying and say, maybe this really is too extreme. Like, maybe this really is too hardcore. Like, I'm all against stopping those who are dangerous, but like, I'm not in favor of killing mutant children who haven't done anything wrong. You know, like, what do you say to those guys? What do you say to them? Are you going to look that cop in the eye and you're going to say, thanks for saving my life, but like you're still a credible threat though. Like, are you really going to say that? William Stryker was an extremist example, but for every extreme William Stryker out there, there's a cop. There's that one cop with red hair who saved his life. And so because of that, like you, you can't take it as extremes. It's really Cyclops making the argument of saying, this is how you become a William Stryker. Sure, you're not a religious fundamentalist who believes that God wants you to kill mutants, but you are becoming like Magneto. And Magneto really is at the end of the day, nothing more than another William Stryker, but on the opposite end of the spectrum. And that's kind of a, a mind blowing perception to throw out there to see Magneto put in that light, but to kind of make the argument that he really kind of is the same way. And so with his faith kind of faith kind of being shaken, Xavier goes forward, really kind of having to ask himself some very serious questions. Is it worth it to continue this peaceful coexistence? You know, is it the Cyclops is better suited to leave the X-Men than he is? There's these different things that go in there, these different arguments that are made. And what this does is it kind of feeds into the future of the X-Men stories under Chris Claremont going forward for the next seven years until Claremont leaves and helps to kind of build things even further. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, Make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace.